Steve Warner, and this is historic RCA Studio B in Nashville, Tennessee. You know, if these walls could talk, man, the incredible music that this place created. This building was built in 1956 at the request of Steve Scholes and the great Chet Atkins. But today we're here to celebrate a wonderful relationship, the 60th anniversary of Chet Atkins and Gretsch Guitars. You know, there's a, a handful of artists out there. Uh, you know, Fred Astaire dances that way, Chet plays the guitar that way, where you do all your work and then you step beyond the work you've done into an area of grace and elegance. And, uh, and Chet absolutely had that. He could get up and play and just move an audience with just a guitar. And that's a gift. I think it goes beyond the players, his technical abilities. He had that, it, it came, but finally, somehow, he got out through here what he had in here. And not everybody can do that. I think that's the gift of it. It was just seemed so unattainable, you know, and still to this day, <laughs> does to a certain degree. You know, certainly at a young age, that was like, wow, yeah, it's sounds like three guys playing the guitar. You know, just like, wow, this is incredible. He had no one to listen to. He had no one to listen to. Uh, and I think eventually, I, I've read that, that, that he heard Merle Travis uh, in Cincinnati maybe playing. But basically, he was the creator. He was the creator of his sound. Came up from way back in the hills. I mean, he told me when he first started working that, you know, they didn't have electricity in one of those places. And he said, uh, we called it the kerosene circuit because they played by kerosene lamps. It was Chet and Jerry Reed and a bunch of other players, but Chet was certainly the, uh, the biggest influence. I mean, he's just a huge body of work and so much to learn from. His songbook was humongous. I mean, he knew every song, as far as I know, known to man. And I don't mean just country songs, pop standards. His breadth of knowledge was unbelievable. He had a smooth touch. That's one of the first things I noticed about his tone of the guitar and his style, that it just flowed like honey. This friend of mine that kind of got me started on guitar over in Benson, North Carolina, where I was raised, he was teaching me what he knew, and he was like the local guitar hero in, in our little town, you know. And, and he told me one day, I was 13, he said, you need to get up in the morning at six o'clock and tune in to WSM. So there's a guitar player on there, and he said he works with the Carter sisters and Mother Maybell. They have a 15 minute radio show. He said, he's the best I've ever heard. And so at 13, I got up the next morning and, uh, and tuned into WSM, and, and you just barely could tune them in, a lot of static but I could still hear good enough to know that, that he probably was the greatest. First time I heard him was on a record that my father had when we were kids. It was in our record collection. It was a um, record called Finger Pickin' Good. No, I was in Tucson at the time when I first heard Chet. I was 14. I was just stunned and amazed with what I heard. I played a record on the radio and I heard it. And, uh, later on about Bought his, uh, bought his first album and, and just sat and played it over and over and over again. You know, I remember uh, you know, having a paper route and going to the record store and there was that record, Fingerstyle Guitar, that had the, the orange Gretsch, just about this much of it, you know, with Chet's hand on it. And I read the liner notes and I bought the record just on that cool guitar and the liner notes. I went home and found that our record player wouldn't play uh, LPs wouldn't pay 33s. So I went to the neighbor's house and played it until the neighbor sent me home, you know, because I kept playing over and over and over. And uh, then I emptied the rest of my piggy bank and went and bought a record player to go with my record because I was just so stunned by what I heard. The first time I heard shit, it was literally a guitar plugged into an amp, no reverb, 
known nothing because it, it probably was 1952. And uh, it, it was the prettiest sound I thought I'd ever heard come out of a guitar. I don't know an age, but I know it was very, very young because I remember certain albums uh, and I can still see the covers, you know, I'd sit and just play those records and couldn't get enough, you know. I remember also thinking, this is impossible. And immediately thinking to myself, well, it couldn't be impossible because he's doing it. It just must be really hard, that's all. And boy, that was a huge moment for me because uh, it meant I wasn't afraid to try. And it didn't bother me that I couldn't do it yet because I knew it wasn't impossible. I just knew it was really hard. And it was really hard, believe me. As a kid, you're sitting there dreaming, man, if I could ever meet him one day, if I could ever get to play with him, what a dream, you know, and uh, it's so funny how it turns out. I think he played from the heart. I think he played direct from the heart. And uh, he it was a gift. I, I think it was a gift that, that came from God. And uh, I, think that, I think that's a good enough answer. I heard uh, the song Yakety Yaks and tried to learn it on guitar at a young age and just didn't quite get it right. You know, I'd always wondered how did he get that sound, how did he get that plucky sound? And um, you know, I realized many years later after I started playing with him that he got that with the thumb pick. To me, I've said it before, I think his bass string rhythm was the key to the kingdom, so far as his feel. It, it, it was always in the pocket, always in the pocket. It's just like if he had a bass player, because Chet is playing. Like a bass player would play that, and like a rhythm guitar player would do this. And then he condenses that down to this, and sometimes a couple. And then that bass was, again, the lower bass, instead, it would be no, he hit the lowest bass he could. I always notice about it, I just picked up on that. His thumb was totally different than Merle Travis. Like Chess was real precise, you know, and it would match up with the bass or the left hand of the piano. Merle Travis, as, as Chet said, he was a stride piano player, so he had the one and the five, you know. Merle Travis, as he said, he was more of a honky-tonk player. So, blomp, 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 which is, which is correct, both of them. They're both correct. And I can't do just the index like he did, I have to cheat. They'd hit all these crazy. little ditties that we do and then when Merle would play this bump, 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 bump. Well, let me play one that Chet would say see the difference <laughs> so that was the difference and Merle was also a little bit more in-your-face player and Chet was just a little bit more structured like a band would have played. They're all good. I love Merle Travis and I love Chet, but there was only, like Lenny Bro said, there was only one Chet, you know? <laughs> yeah, so on his Country Gentleman, he had uh, the zero fret here, and that means the action is very even at this end. And so now, the action that he had up here was higher than most people would play an electric guitar. And I think Part of that is from growing up on an acoustic instrument. So that he's really playing the string. A lot of times people are playing the pickups. They're kind of thinking, how low, how easy can I make this? And he's really at work 
it's a blue-collar gig for him, you know. He, he wants, to, wants to, it's a hard hat, you know. So he's up here working hard with the vibrato, when to hang on, when to let go of this note, when to move like that. And he's really loving the string. And same thing down here, to be able to dig in and get a nice tone. And uh, the vibrato that you want, all those things happen much better if you've got the strings up just a little bit. Uh, I don't know that I'm, I've ever seen another electric guitar player with their strings up as much as that. One of the main things about being a finger picker is that it's a solo style and it doesn't require a band. So you're really your own band. It's particularly with that sound, you know, you've got the whole left hand of the stride piano, ragtime piano, and you can play the melody on the top. So really, it's just you. And I think there's only three instruments really that are designed to play solo, polyphonic. One, the guitar, the piano, and maybe the harp because they're the only things that where you, where you can play several notes at once. Well, I heard Chet say before, he said, well, I was always a sucker for a melody. And, uh, and he said, and I was always just square enough, even as a producer, which we may talk about later, he says, I was always just kind of square enough to kind of understand and listen to what most people would like to hear. And he, uh, he really articulated that through the, his playing of the guitar. Of course, some of it was very complex to a guitar player but it was still simple enough that everybody seemed to like it. Uh, one thing I notice about Chet is he always put the melody out front, you know. You know, you know, you know he had all these little licks and things like that, but you never, you know, question what the melody was, and uh, and he even did that when he would play something slow, you know, uh, and that and I learned a lot of that from Chet because I would play like if I played some, or if it was like a like this. the other guys are playing backup so they're like the piano player like he's louder and Chet always had movement he always had movement his bass was going somewhere his chord structure there were it was going somewhere and so I, I just picked a lot of a lot of that up because he didn't just do the bum chuck thing, you know, which we all love, but uh, but he did some uh, some other things like when he would play, you know. You know, he played very uh, sort of almost neoclassical, but still goes back to the piano. He played a lot like a piano player would have played that. Scotty Moore did the same thing. I remember one time at a award thing, we were all there together and Chet turned around and said, Scotty, how come you were playing that with a thumb pick? And Scotty says, well, because we couldn't afford any more musicians. So I had to play the, the bass and then the, Also, so certainly you want to go grab a Gretsch guitar for you know you would want to do that. That's a good starting place, but uh, it goes back to unfortunately it's uh, it's in your hands. You know he just had and what amazed me about Chet too, I think, and I think a lot of it speaks to this. Anybody that was around Chet a lot would know what I'm saying here. You could go to his office anytime and walk in, other than lunchtime maybe, but. He certainly loved his lunchtime, but you could go in his office any time and he would be practicing. I mean, all the time. He called me one night when I was living in Brooklyn. This was like before, right around the time, after, right after maybe we did the Sneaking Around record, I'd given him my demo tape, the songs that I had wrote, and he called me one time out of the blue. He said, hey, Pat, I was up till four o'clock in the morning trying to learn that lick you played on, on that demo tape. <laughs> And I was, I was like, wow, really? That's really funny. 
you know, I was, I was like, eh, you know, I don't have to practice the day. I'm going on the road and do my little songs, and I've got this. And then you go up to his office and go, here's, he's Chet Atkins, and he's, and one day I walked in the office and he said, Steve, I got to show you. Oh, let me show you this thing, and it was very innovative little riff that he was doing, the way he was catching this little roll. And he goes, check this out. This, and I loved it that he, here he was starting to be an elderly man and was still so excited about it, a lick of thinking, man, that's, I, that always inspired me to go home and get my guitar out and practice because there he was and still pumped up. Oh, you got to hear this, you know. I just think that's cool, you know. I hear he could be out golfing and he's practicing the guitar at age 65 or whatever he was at that time. He always had something new to show me, you know, and share with me. I loved it that he wanted to share it too, you know, so. Yeah, I, there's not a day goes by where I don't play a Chet tune or think about Chet or what he would have done in a certain situation or some lick he would have played. I mean, there's so much to my playing and the way I think about my career and recording and the sound that he creates, I mean, it's, it's, it's there. It's, it, it doesn't go away. There was something about his touch and his tone and the way he played that just, uh, it felt like an invitation, you know. It did not feel like I was listening to a record. I knew it was a record because I had to move the needle a lot, you know. And, uh, and I've heard other people say that same thing, that Chet was not just playing guitar so that lots of people could hear the music. He was calling a lot of us and saying, Learn what you can, come to town, and we'll get together. I mean, it's just the way it felt to me. So I knew there was some future date that I would meet him, even a year into it, I would say, which turned out to be 20 years later, but you know, so. I think that's what caused me to, to play like I do, is listening to Chet and uh, keeping the, the melody line a little bit louder. And when you're doing that, You know, there's always moving on the bass and everything, but these guys, they're, they're muted, so you can, or who would ever have thought to do that? It's just one, one note here. But, that's me. And he'd use his open string. And, I, and I'm sure that's how Brian Setzer gets all, he got all those ideas that he, he would have playing that sort of thing too. And we all did, we all learned from Chet. With Chet, I think it was just the combination of Merle Travis, Segovia, George Barnes, Django Reinhardt, and Les Paul and the guys he were listening to, um, that was what made his style, it was that whole, he didn't stick to the traditions of what those guys were doing, he melded it all together and that's kind of where, where it went, you know, it was just, it's such a perfect style. Django Reinhardt and Merle Travis and uh, Jerry Reed and John D. Loudermilk and Loudermilk brought tunings to town that Chet really liked. Yeah, I think he was very open-minded about about guitar styles and music in general. He liked all kinds of music. I think, yeah, I mean, I don't know if he was into Jimi Hendrix, but he, yeah, he probably was. We never talked about that, but he was into a lot of rock players, you know, and he got Guitar Player Magazine and read it every month. He was into a lot of different rock players, absolutely, and blues guys. Oh, I mean, he loved Larry Carlton and, and um, Eric Clapton and, and George Harrison and you know he of course he was a huge Beatles fan and if you listen to the history of the records that he's made he has dabbled in many many different styles I mean he did classical style stuff and you know rock you know jazz stuff with Lenny Bro you know and st with stuff with Les Paul and and you know he really you know I mean I, like I think you know you would define him as country guitar but, but certainly he, he was 
adventurous. It seemed like that he never quit learning and creating stuff, you know. And I think he would learn, he would learn from anyone. Maybe even, I hope somewhere down the line he noticed something I did. I hope he did, you know, and, and that he picked up on it. Because I sure stole a lot from him. <laughs> I'll never pay back. You know, if you think about Chet Atkins, I mean, he is country guitar, right? That guy was country guitar. But he was so eclectic in his, his musical tastes, and he was always listening for, for different things that, you know, perked his ears up. He always wanted to know how I was getting a certain sound, or, you know, he was always looking to other people to find, wow, heard this thing and um, thought it was really cool, you know. You know, it took me a while to realize um, how much, you know, his Gretches very often would have an extra hole and things like that. And he worked on my guitar a little bit too, and I would watch him and I realized it's not his guitar until it's had a knife and a screwdriver and some sandpaper and a little bit of scotch tape on it, you know, to, to make it be that last little bit that it needs to be. I think that's from growing up in the country where you just fix things all the time, you know. Uh, and from him, I, that's another thing I guess I really learned from him is how to not be afraid of my guitar. I love it that I'd go with him sometimes at lunch early on and he had a, he would say, we'd leave lunch and he would say, I'm gonna drop by Electra. That was a lock, big electronics store or Randolph Rice. He, he loved electronics. So I'm gonna drop by and pick up some tubes. I need a couple 6L6s or whatever he needed. basement studio was kind of his man cave. Very experimental. Yeah, he was definitely experimental. As a matter of fact, he was showing me one time when I was down there, he had a piece of something, a piece of plastic that he was sticking between. He was sticking things in his strings, you know, and he said, oh yeah, I was trying this, you know, to see if I get a different sound. He owned some patents for guitars, uh, in particular to do with tail pieces. And, uh, and so, and maybe the electronics and everything that's back there on the tail end of the guitar. So, but he was always thinking and working and, and trying to be better. And he would, he knew about, he liked young people. He was always asking me about pedals, how to get a, you know, sound with the pedal and, you know, trying to show him how to get a good distortion tone because he was messing around with that, you know. And, um, you know, and he did that song called Jam Man. You know, he got a Jam Man looper when it first came out. And as a matter of fact, there's that, that uh, insurance company commercial that's on television that uses that song called Jam Man. Oh, you said something earlier about uh, Copper Kittle. We should play that. I think guys. we played that on the Opry one We night. did play that before, <laughs> didn't we? Yeah. I think we played it a bunch. But I play that some nights, and when I play shows, I'll do a little segment, talk about Chet a little bit. I'll play some medleys, and sometimes I'll play, uh, throw some different Chet songs, but I usually, Copper Kittle's one I love to play. So yeah, I love you guys want to play it? Yeah, yeah. So how's it go? <laughs> <laughs> you want to kick hey, it off? Well, I, was in, I was in church one night. <laughs> this is funny, but not long ago, I was at this great big church. And I thought, well, I'll play a Chet tune. I started playing Copper Kettle. I'm going, wait a minute. <laughs> that's a, like that's about a still.
<laughs> Something like that. It always astounds me that it's really a three-pronged kind of a career and that he was, everyone knows he was a great guitar player, you know, great, a master guitarist, Mr. Guitar. But just as a record label head, signing the, all the people that he signed, the great artists, you know, who's who. I saw a roster once of like two or three pages of just who names that he produced and or either produced or brought to the label. And it's astounding, you know, Dolly Parton to Waylon to Willie to, you know, on and on and on and on and Elvis and, but, and then, and then that's as a record label head. And now take the third part of it is he was a record producer that produced hits on these people, you know. So it, it astounds me that what he achieved in the years he did it. I mean, and not on a small level either, on a high, high level, all three, you know. So, uh, yeah, it's, I think that gets overlooked sometimes how, how much he did, you know. I don't know how he did it all in this short time, you know, and uh, a really amazing career. Well, Chet had such a, an eye for talent and an ear for talent, you know, and he could spot that in people, and he could see things that I think no one else could have seen, and he could hear it in a song. He could listen to a song and tell you if it was going to be a hit or not. That goes beyond being a guitar player. I mean, Chet, the producer, uh, he was, uh, he changed the course of music and, and the way we hear you know, Don Gibson hits and all those things that, uh, that everybody else wanted to just sort of throw it out the door, but not Chet. Next thing you know, uh, you know, I Can't Stop Loving You came along and all that, that was, that was all Chet. It was amazing. Of course, the Everly Brothers, Roy Orbison, I mean, so much history in this room. I, I can't actually believe I'm sitting here, but. I'll take it. <laughs> he was out in Denver, I think, when uh, Steve Scholes discovered him and uh, brought him back here to record his first album. And Steve was, by that time, running the Hollywood office of RCA, and Chet had been promoted to, he was in charge of RCA here in Nashville. He didn't even want to be a producer, Steve told me, and he said he he just wanted to play. He said, I started adding him to Sessions. And Steve said, I started noticing the stuff that the uh, Sessions that the producers were bringing in play for him. He said, well, that's an interesting idea. Who thought of that? Oh, Chet. Chet thought of that. And he, that happened several times. And he finally said, my goodness, that's amazing. He said, these are good ideas, you know. I mean, just arrangement ideas, they're great or a great idea for a song, whatever. He told Chet, he says, you should produce. No, I don't want to do that. I just want to be a guitar player. I just want to play my guitar. I don't want to produce. I think he said to uh, John Knowles, you know, I owe my success to my skills with a guitar and a razor blade. You know, meaning he was an expert at cutting tape and splicing. Well, today we don't need to do that. Today we've got Pro Tools and, and Cubase and all those things, and we, there's no tape splicing anymore. But back in the day, that was a highly skilled job, and those guys were rolling the tape backwards and forwards to find that exact note and marking the X, and that was Chet doing that. He was doing a lot of the engineering. He also had a, a real respect for the uh, musicians, because he would choose them to be the ones that ought to be on that record. That was part of knowing how the record ought to sound. And I remember one time a run-through and Chet's back there listening, and he kind of looks like he's playing with an amplifier or something, but they're running through the tune, and they run through, and Chet gets on the talk back, and he says to the piano player, he said, uh, I said, in that bridge there, I think it goes to an A-flat on that one spot right there. <laughs> so he listened to that whole thing, you know, not even, not even staring at it, and picked out the piano and gave the guy, you know, so he flat out knew music. And, and of course, in that moment, he's not only getting the result he wants, now everybody in the studio, all the musicians know Chet is really listening. That's something when I was around him, I, I felt like uh, I was in the room with Abe Lincoln or something. You, know, you didn't, you weren't there to mess around. He didn't ever demand anything of anybody except by his presence. The few times I worked with him, I did notice that about him, that he was in total control of what was going on with no, he wasn't power hungry. He would look, wasn't look, hey, look at me, I'm the producer. You do what I say. 
he, he gave you all the freedom in the world. You know, one, one thing uh, that really appreciated, and uh, kudos to Fred Gretsch. No. You know, for bringing all these back. Oh, you kidding? And oh, getting them yeah. under the uh, under the the legacy of Chet Atkins with Gretsch again, once again. Yeah. And not that it's just a brand, but it's just part of our lives. It's the sound. It it's is the, the sound great, great sound. Made the hits. Absolutely. Uh, really. Yeah, yeah. It's just a beautiful great thing. thing yeah. It's a wonderful thing for every guitar player. I think we're so blessed to see Chet right. and Gretsch back and together especially again. Especially the, yeah. the the Chet models specifically. I mean, they took. It wasn't just a model. Uh, of Country Gentleman or 6120, they've, you know, this this is one of those, they also got the specific Chet models that were taken from his actual guitars, the original 6120, mm -hmm. uh, the CGP, and uh, the uh, the Country Gentleman, that were, all the measurements were taken, so they're, they're replicas of Chet's actual guitars yeah. as well. And they sound sure. great. Oh, and for they sure. just sound and play, play great. great. Sound yeah. great, right, right. Yeah. How about a little yeah. bit of Salted Dog Blues or something? You like okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. Chet. <laughs> Every lick. <laughs> Let's 
I heard someone in an interview one time said, well, Chet, I heard you, you created the Nashville sound, you and Owen Bradley, and, and the way you brought strings in. He said, yeah, and I apologize for that. You know? <laughs> and someone asked him one time, he said, can you describe the Nashville sound now? And he put his finger in his, or his hand in his pocket and jingled the change. <laughs> so he had such a wit about him, and he never would take all that too serious. And uh, I don't think he ever took himself as serious as everyone else did. He was a very, very funny person. I mean, just hysterically funny person. I mean, I, I would just get me laughing about stuff all the time. And in a very, and he was very funny in a very mischievous way. He was always trying to like get you. One night in Anchorage, Alaska, we were playing a show, and I was playing bass, and I was kind of, we were playing a kind of up tempo song. I was kind of mm, boom, boom, playing my thing over there, and and Chet throws the solo to a, to Tony Migliori, played piano with us, and. Folks, Tony Miglory, the applause, you know, and he's he's playing his butt off on a solo, and Chet kind of walks over to me. For only my purpose, no one in the whole planet heard this but me, Chet bends over and he says, has anyone ever told you you're the world's greatest bass player? And I, I'm, boom, boom, I go, no. He goes, have you ever wondered why? <laughs> and I'm thinking, did he just say that? I'm the only person on the earth that, had the benefit of hearing that. It was just for me, you know. I thought that was hilarious, you know. You know, he, we would do a song where everybody would go around and take a chorus, you know, Pat's gonna yodel for us, you know, or something that just always put you on the spot. And, you know, he owned lots of rental property up and down Music Row here. And one day after lunch, we went by the hardware store and he bought a box of light bulbs. And we went by one of his rental properties to replace light bulbs. And this one uh, building was one of the old houses that had the high ceiling. And um, he had a ladder there in the closet. So he brings the ladder out and he climbs the ladder to put bulbs in the chandelier. And I'm down here holding the ladder. And he turns around and he says, he says, now hold on to that ladder. He said, you know, I'm a legend. And if you drop me, there'd be a lot of explaining to do. <laughs> and that's the way he would let himself be a legend was to joke about it, you know. But he really, you know, by that time he was in the Hall of Fame and you know, desk full of Grammys and so forth, but changing the light bulbs in the rental property. So I think doing chores, you know, is something he grew up with, and it's something he kept with him because it was a way of staying uh, normal, staying grounded, you know. I remember Lee Hazelwood thought he was pretty quick, and they were in the office one day, and Chet says, well, Lee, how do you like it here in Nashville? He says, well, this Lee says, well, I think it's uh, nice. He says, I may, may get me a job and stay here. <laughs> I noticed the janitor out there is sweeping. He says, maybe I could take his job, you know. Chess says, no, he says, I don't think so. He says, that old boy is college educated. He says, you better stick to producing. <laughs> Just little stories about Chet. Chet was known for being pretty frugal. I mean, he was a depression child. Everyone, everyone in town knew about that, and that's it's, it's a mentality from, from, you know, growing up in the depression. They had nothing, they had nothing at all, so. Yeah, a lot of those stories. I remember one time, uh, actually, St St Steve Warner, Chet gave him a, a White Falcon guitar. And, uh, hey, thanks, Chet, that's great. I think Chet said, do you have a Grinch? Hey, Steve, do you have a Grinch guitar? And Steve said, no, I don't, Chet. said, well, take that White Falcon out, out there in the corner right there. So uh, Steve took it, and three or four years later, Chet got to reading about what they were worth. Uh, you know, the old classic, the original. <laughs> he said, uh, called up Steve and said, no, those white falcons are, uh, they're worth quite a bit of money these days. They're pretty hot property. Uh, you know, if things get bad, I might have to ask for that back. Because that was a depression, you know, he was thinking of Black Monday, 1929. You know, it, it amazes me to, uh, his sense of who was who and what they had to offer was highly refined, uh, and he trusted it. It took him a while to trust it, I'm sure, but by the time I met him, if he was interested in something, he pursued it, he didn't question. Uh, he called it, he said, I gotta trust my ears, is what he said, you know. Which is, his ears were like his instinct and his judgment and, and all that stuff. He would tell stories too about the, about people playing, I remember him talking about Roger Miller playing for him the first time and how nervous he was and he couldn't, couldn't play. And I thought about that and I thought, 
why wasn't I nervous the first time I played for him? And, and I realized later he did everything he could to not be Chet Atkins the legend. He tried to be Chet Atkins the guy, you know, to tone it down. But some people just couldn't, couldn't be calmed down. But for some reason, when I first met him, I just felt like I was around somebody I'd always known. You know, just uh, a just very gracious, very, very gracious guy. Helped a lot of people out, especially in this town as well. You know, he certainly introduced me around town. Rather than me go and meet people, he would say, Let me, I've got to take you to meet this guy. And when I first came to Nashville, he would, uh, he took us around several places and introduced us to folks. And that means a lot more when somebody like, you know, Chet's introducing you to somebody, it means a lot more than you just sticking out your hand and saying, hey, I'm Richard Smith. Chet says, hey, this is Richard Smith. It means a heck of a lot more. And uh, he did that for, for a lot of people, I know that. He called me in one day, he says, yeah, I've kind of followed you through the years. I know you, you know, you, you do church stuff and, and things, I admire that. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> He, he was walking down the steps and had this guitar in his hand, and he says, I've been thinking about you. You've been holding this for a long time. I want you to have one of my guitars. He's just just a very generous guy. He didn't have to do that, you know, just a wonderful guy. He had no idea how that would just, how that lifted me up, because at that time I was really thinking of quitting and not playing out anymore and just settling in and just staying at home. and which is not a bad idea, really, <laughs> because it's not for everybody. It's very difficult to travel all the time. But it was a time in my life to where I really needed that. And evidently, it was a God thing, too, because, and I think uh, Chet was a very spiritual person. I think he was, he was, uh, he felt led to do that. I don't think he would just do that uh, on his own, even though, like I say, he was generous, but I don't think he gave guitars away every day. And uh, that touched my heart. I mean, it really did. And, uh, and in some ways, changed my life. The day I got to town, he drove me straight to the union, and he paid my way into the Nashville Musicians Union. And he said, "If you're," he said, "it's a right to work state, but if you're going to be working with me, you got to be in the union." And so I was very, very lucky. And I mean, I till to this day, you know, I just, and it was not just Chet, but also Merle, his daughter, and Leona. I mean, they all took me in and just really helped me out. You know, I was a new guy to town, and Chet introduced me to people, and I got to kind of hit the ground running, and I've never really stopped working since. I've heard a lot of people say, oh, he had a gift, oh, he was blessed. Well, we all have gifts, you know, but, but he rolled his sleeves up, too, and uh, he put his work in, and his work is always driven well, it's driven by several things in his case. I think one of them is his upbringing as a poor person in the country wanting to, you know, move out of that. And that kind of was always there. But beyond that, I think there was some kind of a vision of like what things sounded like, how much he loved music. Tom Bresh told me this. He said that it's not that Chet even wanted to be remembered as a musician. He said, I want to be remembered as an intellectual. And I, th I think because of the whole thing about being in East Tennessee and it was a serious thing. He, he, didn't, he didn't like the hillbilly thing. He wanted to uh, distance himself from that. Even though the music that he played was very much that kind of music. It was mountain music. He was playing old fiddle tunes, a lot of that stuff. He knew the music was great, but still he, he, was, he was a businessman as much as he was a musician. I think that was important to him. take you back every time I heard him play uh, to a child, you know, to a kid 13 years old, hearing that sound for the first time. I love the fact that he was, uh, how gentle he was, how nice and humble he was, you know, and uh, just everything you would picture him to be as I always pictured him to be, you know. Very grounded and, you know, never, I love it that he never forgot where he came from too. He was always very you know, very humble about his upbringing, you know, and his, uh, his roots. 
I mean, he knew who he was. He was an executive. He knew he was. He carried himself well. He was stately. He was a country gentleman. But at the same time, there was a, a, just a hometown sort of personality about him that he made everybody feel comfortable. And if he said anything about you, ever, I mean, it went with you for the rest of your life. People sometimes still talk about something Chet said when they introduced me on stage. Chet would have never dreamed that would have ever affected me the rest of my life. And he carried that kind of weight. He was an amazing person. That was the, the thing I remember the, the most when I first met Chet. But just playing some tunes with him, listening to his timing, listening to his uh, the execution of uh, the notes that he played, it was just, okay, this is, this is what I'm supposed to play like. He was not the kind of guy who, who would just wanted to stop at life. He was always moving forward. I mean, I remember when he got sick, you know, and he got back out of the hospital, he was like, we were playing a, a year and a half long stint over there at, at Cafe Milano downtown, and he had different guests come and play with him. And, um, after he got he got out of the hospital, he was we were off for a couple months, and as soon as he got out, he was like, "Man, let's go, let's start playing again." I remember uh, Chet telling me one time he was playing in Las Vegas, and uh, there was backstage the stage manager would help him take those three steps up with his guitar and step out and do his act, and then he would give him a hand and help him walk down. At the end of his run. The stage manager says to Chet, he said, I've helped a lot of people up and down these three steps. He said, you're the only guy that's the same at the top of the steps as he is at the bottom of the steps. Now, Chet told me that story, which is to say he valued that observation a lot, to be the same at the, at the top of the three steps as at the bottom. You know, so. I sure miss him now that he's gone. We went to his funeral, and uh, he had it at the Ryman Auditorium. And... Uh, up the street from the Ryman, there's a statue of Chet sitting there on a stool playing the guitar in bronze. And there's a place if you want to get your picture taken, you can sit down next to him <laughs> and play with him. Anyway, he said one rainy night, he said the wife drove him out there. He hadn't seen it and he heard it was there and he wanted to go see it. So one, one rainy night, he says, this, he'd been pretty sick, so he says, but he's feeling better, so he got out and he got in the car and, and his wife drove, drove him past there and he says, I looked out at that, he says, it's the most beautiful thing I ever saw. And uh, I thought, there you go. Thank you.